organizers are extremely honored and uh, happy to have with us today distinguished professor David Harvey uh, join us from uh, New York, uh, a prominent, world prominent geographer and Marxist uh, intellectual. Uh, David has been a regular participant in uh, their seminars since the first one in uh, 2011, if I remember well, or 2010, I can't remember. Uh, and uh, he has been always willing to help us here in Greece, particularly during the crisis years in the Eurozone and afterwards. Uh, we remember him in occupied Syndagma Square, in occupied Earth, the Greek national broadcast radio, uh, giving lectures in packed uh, aulas, helping our students, uh, participating in rallies, and being, let's say, always active, even from long distance during those difficult years. And uh, for those reasons, we are, let's say, thankful for him, uh, both for his help all those years, but also for joining us once again, this time from uh, New York. David, thanks a lot. And the floor is yours. OK, thank you. It's uh, uh, wonderful to be with you all again, even if it's uh, in this uh, zoomy kind of kind of way. So I'm uh, I'm delighted uh, to have this opportunity to talk with you again. And uh, unfortunately, you mentioned that you've been eating red mullet. <laughs> I have got envious <laughs> of the fact that I can't uh, can't get there uh, to to join you on such uh, great uh, uh, occasions. Um, I, what I what I was thinking about uh, uh, this morning was, you know, what long-term impact would this COVID thing have? And and a couple of thoughts uh, occurred to me, which uh, are rather distressing in a way, because I suspect in five or maybe ten years' time, when we look back at COVID and we look, uh, for instance, at the trace of the stock market, we will see it had absolutely no impact whatsoever, apart from a brief collapse in February for two days, and then everything else shot on up. So as far as this is concerned, this is a wonderful uh, idea that uh, actually COVID is just sort of, sort of blip in, 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 in the, the, the stock market. The second thing, uh, that occurred to me was that to the degree that uh, you know, neoliberalism and that has always been about uh, the concentration and centralization on an increasing scale of uh, wealth and all the rest of it, that uh, COVID was a wonderful example of that principle, never let a good crisis go to waste because the upper classes and the affluent folk have come out of it far, far better than they were initially. So that again, if you if you looked at, for instance, the Gini coefficients and all those sorts of things, you would see uh, that the trend towards increasing inequality was accelerated during COVID and, if, and therefore it was not a, a radical interruption of uh, what, what went on before. So in these respects, it seems to me that, that to the degree that we come out of this, well, people will obviously talk a lot about how we need much more effective national health services, defensive mechanisms, we have to deal with these social inequalities which underlie uh, the differential impact of the disease, all of those things will be talked about for a couple of years and then everybody will forget them, <laughs> this is what I, I, I suspect. But there was one great impact of COVID, uh, which I'm happy to report to you, and I think it's quite positive because when I was locked down, being an academic, I'm used to working at home. 
thought, okay, so I'm locked down, I'm working at home, and I'm saying, what the hell am I going to do with my time? And I really didn't know what to do, except I thought, well, you know, for a long time, I've had this fantasy of writing a companion to the Grundrisse. So I started writing the companion to the Grundrisse, and yesterday I sent the manuscript off to Verso. So this is one of the great products of COVID, <laughs> is that I've written a companion uh, to the Grundrisse. I can tell you, it was, oh, it was mind blowing in many ways. It was also shocking to me in many ways that here's a text that I'd known, you know, for nearly 30, 40 years. And, and I'd never really quite understood it in the way that I ended up understanding it this time around. And it has a lot to do with the, you know, the density and the complexity of Marx's thought and the fact that he goes off and starts playing with little arithmetic examples for 15 pages and you can't follow what the hell he's doing and all this kind of stuff. So it was a, it was, it, it was a really a, a very hard, very hard. And, and, and I have to say, however, it was a great learning experience. So I thought I'd try and share with you some of the conclusions that I came to out of reading the Grundrisse, because this to me is mind blowing. It's gonna change the world, see. This is far more than COVID did. If everybody reads the Grundrisse and gets it right, it's gonna be really a fantastic thing. So what are the major, major things that I found? The first thing I found was that actually Marx was being much more systematic than I'd originally given him credit for, much more systematic. And he was systematic around certain conceptual apparatuses. And the central concept that he comes back to again and again and again is the idea of capital as a totality. And this word totality crops up again and again and again. And it's interesting. There's a lot of people who have written commentaries about the Grundrisse, and I went back and looked at some of them, and I can't find any of them that talk about this idea of the totality. Well, what kind of a totality is it? It's an organic totality. And in fact, at the end of the day, it's going to be not even simply organic in the sense that it's an organism, but it's an organic in the sense that it's a whole ecosystem. It's an ecosystem that develops in certain ways, has a history, expands, works, transforms itself within. So it's an evolving totality. It's not a fixed totality. It's an evolving one. Now, the totality, however, has to be understood as being made up of different circulatory systems. And I'll talk about them in a minute. Now, this may sound odd, but I'll use an analogy so everybody understands where I'm coming from. We can take the human body as a totality. It's a totality within an environment, but it has a boundary and all those of it. So the human body can be seen as a totality. That human body has different circulatory systems within it. Okay, the heart deals with the circulation of the blood. Oxygen comes through the lungs. Through the gastroenteral system comes energy. Uh, the liver and the kidneys deal with waste disposal. The neurology deals with the coordination of a lot of these things. So the human body can be disaggregated and to say that although it's a totality, it's a totality made up of these different circulatory systems. And these different circulatory systems obviously contribute to one another in various ways. Now Marx's analogy, and it's me making the analogy, Marx, Marx's analogy here is to say, well, what are the circulatory systems that make up capital as a totality? The first principle I would want to say is this. You don't go into the idea of the human body and say one of these circulatory systems is more important than the other. You don't go in there and say, oh, the only thing that really matters is the heart. So, you know, if you're sick somewhere else, that doesn't bother. That's minor kind of questions. Within the human body, any one of these circulatory systems can fail. If any one of them fails, you're dead. And so the life of the circulatory uh, uh, depends upon the viability of the circulatory systems which comprise it. And there's no hierarchy involved here. It's not as if the brain takes control and everything and yeah, uh, certain messages get sent around and, and, all, and all the rest of it. But the circulatory systems then are supporting the totality. Now, the totality, however, of the human body exists in a world. 
So you could give a medical diagnosis of why somebody dies and say they died from this and this and this, but then you would want to know something about the environmental conditions under which that medical condition ar arose. So that if you have an opioid epidemic, you can say opioid epidemic, where is that coming from? It's coming from deindustrialization and the abandonment of whole classes of, uh, of, of ex-workers and in Ohio and that sort of thing. So you then say, the totality of the human body exists in a broader context of totality. So this is, this is how this analogy works. Capital is going to be looked at as a totality. He looks at it as a particular internal structure of capitalism. So capital as a totality exists in an environment which is, which is, total, which is the, the, the sort of total context in which in which capital operates. And chief amongst that are metabolic relation to nature, the production of second nature, the reconfiguration of uh, built environments and all those kinds of things. And then there's the kind of, kind of cultural environment as well. So the, the, the inner circulation of capital exists in this environment in which there are cultural, historical circumstances and, and also kind of not what you might call metabolic relation to nature circumstances. But Marx's focus in the Grundrisse is upon the internal structure. And the internal structure is made up of different circulatory systems. And if you look at the Grundrisse, the first circulatory system he looks at is the circulation of money. Now, he could have started with commodities and barter and exchange, but he, he starts really with money. So first 150 pages are taken up discussing the circulation of money. The circulation of money without capital. It's very important to see the circulatory system is autonomous and independent in its own way and has its own logic and its own laws. And then the big question is going to arise what happens to this circulatory system of money in a context where money is being used as capital? And that is going to be another circulatory system. But we look at the circulation of money as something independent. That's very important. But, but then Marx, later in, in the Grundrisse, starts to talk about the circulation of uh, labor capacity. And this is identified as a, as a different circulatory system. And, and this different circulatory system has certain qualities. So let me go over, for example, what, how Marx sets up the idea of the circulation of labor capacity. And I'll simplify it and extend it in some way so you know, people get a better sense of, uh, of what's at stake here. Okay, the laborers at home, in, 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 in the nest of social reproduction and, and, and daily life, but the laborer goes out into the labor market. Now in the labor market, the laborer, the worker is a seller. They're selling their labor power. And as a seller, they're competing with other sellers. I'm competing with you and so on. And I will start to tell the people who I'm trying to sell my labor power to not to trust those Italians or those, those Puerto Ricans or, you know, I, I, all kinds of nasty things go on in the labor market. But it's about selling and all the things that have, you have to go through in selling your good. And so the worker in the first persona is a seller. And then finally gets the job and goes into the labor process. And then, uh, I don't have to go into this because I'm sure everybody knows what I'm talking about. The labor process, okay, it's, you're no longer operating as a, a, as a seller. You're there and you're in a class relation between capital and labor and the whole kind of question of the labor process organized. And so that something comes out of that, which is a very different persona, which contrasts with how you were when you were in the moment of, uh, of, of, of you're selling your labor power. Now, at the end of the week, the worker gets a wage and they have money in their pocket. And nobody is in a position to tell them what to do with the money. They have a certain autonomy with the money. They can do what they like with it. They, are, they, 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 they carry their social bond with society in their pocket, as Marx puts it. And as such, they have all kinds of things that they can possibly do. So they become a money manager. How are they going to use their money? Are they going to save it uh, and, 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 and try and for, for old age or something like that? What are they going to do with their money? Are they going to splurge it? What, 
how they choose and what they choose to do with their money is, you know, very, very much their own, own business. Capital will try to come in and steal it back from them in all kinds of ways. They're given credit cards and things like that. So, so this, but there's a monetary moment in this circulation of, of, uh, of labor capacity. And that monetary moment is very important because somebody may decide that to hell with all the rest of this circulatory process, I'm going to try to save enough money so that at some point or other I can, you know, set up a coffee shop or a bodega or something like that. They, you know, so some people will sacrifice on that line. But so the, the money moment is a, is a very significant moment. But then comes the next moment, which is the worker at some point has to go into uh, the world and be a buyer of commodities. They go over to buy the commodities, which many of they have contributed to making. So they go into the, into, in, into the market and they buy. And at that point, they take on the role of buyer. They took on the role of seller in the first phase, money manager, laborer, now they take on the role of buyer. And as a role of buyer, they are actually sitting there with many, many different other people who are buyers, not necessarily workers. And Marx kind of has an interesting thing. Marx kind of says, well, you know, when the worker enters in and becomes a buyer, their, 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 their identity as worker is, is uh, exhausted and, and is laid to one side. They don't have an identity as worker anymore. Their identity is that of buyer. And as a buyer, they get into struggles because they're dealing with, you know, uh, price gouging. They're dealing with pharmaceutical companies which are ripping you off. They're dealing with, you know, landlords taking as much as they can in rent. So you could, so, so, so at that moment is also another moment where the worker has a certain persona, which is I'm a buyer, I'm trying to get co those commodities I need to survive, support my life and social reproduction. Then comes the next point, which is they take the commodities and they go back to the living space in which they have, I don't know, households, families, com communes or whatever, and daily life is constructed in a certain kind of way. So this is, and then, and then the next day they go out to the labor market again. Now, obviously this is a schematic thing, but it's very interesting because what it says is, who is the worker? Who, you know, there's a tendency to say, well, okay, there's a proletarian subject and that's it. But in this formulation, you see the worker takes on these many, many different personas and there are trade-offs to be had. That is, you can put up with doing some bullshit jobs and horrible kind of alienating labor in order to get enough money to actually enjoy the cornucopia of, you know, what Andre Gortz calls, you know, consumerism, uh, compensatory consumerism. You can kind of, a worker can go in there and say, okay, I'll put up with all this garbage in the labor market and in the, in, in, in the living, in, in the work process and in, in, in the living process in order to save enough money that I'll go off and, you know, top, retire at age 60 and go and do what I want. So, so there are all those, all, those, all those decisions which are being made and there are trade-offs being made. And of course, capital will emphasize those trade-offs. Capital will basically say things like, well, you know, if you are disciplined in the labor process and if you behave yourself in the labor market and do all the right kinds of things, you can one day aspire to join the American dream of a homeowner and car in the drive and all that kind of stuff. So capital will play the games with the others. And, my, and again, the, the whole kind of question of social reproduction, what goes on there? Well, the laborer has to come out with the kind of facilities which are, uh, are going to be able to be saleable in the labor force. So there's going to have to be training there, education there training in the household, training in, in the schools and all this kind of stuff. So, so, there's, there, there's, so this circulationary process is a is, is very interesting one because Marx makes, my, I think, a very interesting argument in, in the Grundrisse about political subjectivity. Political subjectivity, he said, is based upon material experience. And the worker has all of these different material experiences and therefore has a fragmented subjectivity unless somebody talks to them about the theory of the totality. And the totality would then look and say, okay, you are in this system. You have all these different experiences. Capital is telling you there's a trade-offs, all sorts of trade-offs which you can, you can make and trying to keep you disciplined within that system. But at certain point, class consciousness 
is going to have to be a consciousness derived from the notion of the totality. So what Marx is trying to teach is to teach this concept of the totality in such a way that you would actually start to see where you are in the system and realize the fetishistic beliefs which get constructed around all of these different experiential points. In other words, Marx calls these different points moments. There is the moment of being a buyer. There is a moment of being a seller. There's a moment of being a laborer. There's a moment of being manage manager. And all these different moments have different qualities to them and therefore different experiences and therefore are likely to lead to different political subjectivities. And then the question arises, well, how the hell can you get a proletarian consciousness out of this system? Well, Marx is then basic to saying, well, once you understand that this is the system in which you're embedded and that all these point, all these moments are related to each other and configured with each other, then you can't just say, well, actually, maybe I can figure out a different kind of, of, of totality. Uh, and that different kind of totality will be created by interventions at each one of those points. That is, you can't have an intervention in the labor market that doesn't have ramifications for everything else. It's like any totality that the elements of it, the moments of it, are contributing to each other and the worker is going through all of them. This is, uh, to me, was, was, it, was, a, was a very instructive kind of, kind of, kind of moment. Because what, what it does is it suggests that you cannot oversimplify uh, this ocean, notion of proletarian consciousness or class consciousness. You have to recognize that it has to be constructed on the basis of, 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 of a critical understanding of all of these different experiences which the worker is likely to go through. So this is one circulation process, which, is, which Marx looks at and starts to talk, talk about as being absolutely critical. Then comes the, the way in which, well, how does capital relate to the circulation of labor capacity? And how does capital relate to the circulation of money? Now, the study of the circulation of money is very confused by the fact that Marx was obviously on some big feud with Proudhon and the Proudhonists. And so a lot of the stuff in money is muddled up with critiques of Proudhon and all this kind of stuff. And I, I, I frankly, you know, somebody or other will obviously go through the Grundrisse and look very carefully at how Marx is relating to Proudhon and so on. I couldn't be bothered after a bit and decided, well, this is every time Proudhon came up, I sort of go, oh God, no, you know, forget it. And the idea of the totality then is, is, is relating to the circulation of money is going on inside of it, but it's going to be a capital. Capital relates to the capacity to labor in a very, very certain way. And Marx actually then has a great deal of detail on that interrelation between capital and what it's about. And, 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 and it, he uses the concept of alienation. Now, again, in the Grundrisse, the concept of alienation is foundational. Alienation is really foundational. Fundamental, you have to look at. Most people think Marx dealt with alienation back in the economic and philosophic manuscripts, and then after that, he abandoned it. Well, he, he did for a little while, and Altus Ero kind of says, well, that was all the humanistic marks back then, and it never happened again. Well, the Grundrisse, alienation is back. It's back as a scientific concept. It's about the loss that comes. The loss that comes as the laborer takes labor capacity, their labor capacity, and it has to be alienated but in order to be captured by capital. And you actually end up with it with a with an incredible kind of thing in this in within the totality, which is alienated capital and alienated labor entwining with each other to the point where they actually cannot be disentangled. You cannot get rid of alienated capital without getting rid of alienated labor. You cannot get rid of alienated labor without getting rid of alienated capital. So that point of collision is a point of, uh, of something which is very, very deep in, in inside of the Grundrisse. And I suspect many people coming, coming from a Marxist tradition will readily recognize uh, what, what, what that is about. But the circulation of capital is itself rather different. And some of you may have seen this diagram I like to use where in which I say, okay, the capital circulation process starts with some money being used as capital. Some money being used as capital means that it's going to be involved in the buying and selling of labor power. 
So it's going to buy labor capacity. It's going to buy a means of production as commodities. It's going to put those commodities together to create a labor process out of which comes another commodity, which is then sold in the market. And the value is realized in the market. And that value is then distributed amongst the various factions of capital that have to be get their due. So some of it will go in taxes, some of it will go uh, in interest, some of it will go in land rent, some of it will go to merchant capital, or some of it will go, go to the direct producer. So Marx talks about that as a circulatory process. And that circulatory process dominates the central part of what the Grundrisse is about. Marx talks about the various elements of it. It's a very uh, sort of a very tense uh, li literature here. And something comes up in the middle here, which I, I, I want to share with you, which is very, very strange. That is, Marx at one point starts to say, how is capital constructed, this circulatory process? And, 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 and what are the consequences of capital doing this? And when you read the passage, and it's about sort of uh, half a page long, more than half a page long, you see that Marx has, it comes out of it with incredible admiration for what capital has achieved in terms of liberating us from sort of idolatry and religious fanaticism and all of that sort of thing. It's liberated from us and, and it's created new technologies and new capacities and powers. And you read this and you're thinking, my God, he's, he's an incredible advocate for the, the glories of capital. And what a wonderful thing that has been historically. Historically, this has changed the world in ways that's brought us to the edge of the capacity to do you know, fantastic things. And then he talks a little bit about the barriers that exist in social relations to doing the fantastic things that capital has brought us to. So on the one hand, you get this incredible kind of story of, of, of the liberatory force of capital, the creation of the possibility of real individualism, the capacity, all of these capacities of, of new relation to nature. And he talks about the domination of nature, not in the crude sense of domination, but we learn to live with nature in such a way that we can manipulate it to our own ends and so on. So this is, I mean, I mean this is a fantastic sort of passage. I mean, these passages in the Grundrisse are where Marx takes off and fantasizes about things in a way, are, are just, uh, just gems. And this is, this, so this is, there's this one. About a hundred pages later, there comes another essay where Marx talks about, oh, well, it seems as if capital's done all these great things, but in fact, it is, what it's given us is it's given us possibilities, but emptied all of those possibilities any real meaning. So you end up with a kind of tremendously sad kind of notion of what capital has done. It's created wealth, but wealth in such a way that only the very rich and the ultra rich can exp experience it. And by the way, wealth is measured in monetary things and not in disposable time, which I would like it to be. So, so, so Marx kind of, is there so you get a really positive view of capital and all the glories that it has done historically and then a very negative one where all the negative things come out tremendously terrible negative things come out the absence of meaning the emptiness the hollowing out of humanity you know and and, and it's a sort of a, an antidote to the the, the possibilities exist, which existed in the economic and philosophic manuscripts. So, so, so you get this, this, this incredible contrast. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, this is, this is like uh, Du Bois and double consciousness. That we have a double consciousness about capital. And I think, and when I started to think about it, I think we all do. There's a side of us which kind of has, wow, I love these cell phones. Wow, I love all this stuff. I love the fact that I can get all that music from Alexa when I want, you know, I, it, it's fantastic. And then there's the emptiness, the loss of meaning, which clearly politically is, is, is being represented around the world right now in big, big ways. So that distinction between the two and the double consciousness that exists and how we can therefore con confront the double consciousness that all of us feel that I think all of us feel in relationship to this system, which is the system that, that, is, that is capital. And what exactly can we do in the relationship of that double consciousness? 
Now, now I have an example of this double consciousness, which is a sad example in many ways. Yeah, you know, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time in Latin America and, you know, there's been a lot of leftist governments and they've engaged in what I would call left developmentalism. You know, this is what Correa did, this is what Morales did, more or less, this is what the Sandinistas tried to do, and so on. It's, it, 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 it's a left developmentalism. Correa came to power on the back of an indigenous movement and also a left movement. And the indigenous movement was very strong in the 1990s in Ecuador. And there were all these ideas about, well, Ecuador is going to be a plurinational state. Ecuador was going to be one a state in which acknowledged the rights of nature, all these kinds of things. Correa came into power and started to work with those things, but within a very short time, he was absolutely attacking the indigenous base. He pushed it down, down, and down. And there, at the end of Correa's term, there was a big demonstration. And what was interesting about the demonstration is the people who went to it, they had to be very careful where they went because half of the demonstration came from the right wing and half the demonstration came from the left wing. I mean, Correa attacked Action Ecologica, he attacked many of the eco-feminists and he put them in jail. He, 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 was, he, was, he was ruthless with them. Now, there was a, an academic, there was a, a, a recent presidential election in, in Ecuador. And in the primary election, three people came ahead. One was a guy called Arauz, who we knew in, in, in Ecuador quite well. And he he's came out of the left developmentalist tradition that Correa had set up. The second was a sort of uh, office day right wing uh, business guy who, well, stands for all things like that. But he only got 20% of the vote. And, and Arauz got about 35% of the vote. The third guy was from the indigenous community and he came very close to the, the two and three were very close together. There was only about a thousand votes that separated them. Come the general election, you would have thought the indigenous guy would vote for the, or the indigenous people would vote for Arauz. They didn't. They cast their ballot votes null because there was no meaning to the left developmentalism that Korea pushed. And a lot of it was against the meaning that they, they were, were locating in relationship to the world around them. And we see at the end of the Korea thing that, that uh, Korea betrayed the Yasuni initiative. He uh, uh, opened up uh, the whole of South Ecuador to mining exploration by the Chinese because while Korea separated from the United States, he brought in the Chinese. So here you have a situation in left developmentalism in Latin America, in which there is, if you like, a model one of the sort that, that I've mentioned in terms of this consciousness, emphasizes the model one, ignores entirely the model two, which is the, the, the emptiness and the hollowness of what the exercise. Much of what Korea did ended up being hollow, empty, in terms of its meaning for people. Whereas, so this double consciousness is, is, is incredible. And it fills the Grundrisse. The Marx is always coming back to it and saying, well, you know, and I, I had to remind some people, you know, if you look at what happened to Morales in, in Bolivia, there was some of this going on. He betrayed to some degree his, his own indigenous base. Uh, remember the Sandinistas uh, and the left developmentalism imposed on the Mesquite uh, groups of uh, the Pacific part of Nicaragua which allowed the Contras to come in and basically destroy the, the Nicaraguan re revolution. So there's an issue here, a big political issue here about developmentalism, yes, but it's gotta be developmentalism with meaning and it's acknowledging those organizations in society that have some meaning and associate meaning and indigenous populations in, in Andean uh, Latin America are a very good example of exactly what that politics is about. And the left in Latin America has always been a develop, left developmentalism, frequently attacking that uh, indigenous uh, well, you know, well-being, or or only giving you know very brief mention of it. 
So this is this is at the center of the Grundrisse, this, this whole kind of double consciousness question. Very, very, very significant. And I think that therefore, again, Marx is, is, is really trying to, to straddle that and to say, how are we going to deal with this? The next step Marx takes is to say, all right, well, we've got the circulation of capital, we've got the circulation of money, we've got this labor circulation. At a certain point, the circulation of capital splits into two streams. One is circulating capital, and the other is fixed capital. Now, there's an interesting kind of discussion here about fixed capital. At what point does fixed capital become uh, an autonomous and independent form of circulation? And Marx builds a, a history of this. He says, you know, we start off with the circulation of capital and there's fixation going on. That is, things get stuck in particular moments. So in the, in the transition from, say, uh, production to realization and monetization, maybe the commodity sits there for too long, in which case there's going to be some devaluation involved. So Marx talks about fixation as, as, as a minor problem, which connects to devaluation. But then comes the problem of all of the different turnover times of different components of capital within the division of labor, some on an annual basis, some on three year basis, but machines taking 10 years to circulate. At what point does fixed capital become a separate entity and a separate circulation process? And when it does, what is its use, utility? And Marx's definition of fixed capital is something that is used in relationship to the capital accumulation process. If it's not used, it's not fixed capital. So you can't discuss fixed capital in terms of material qualities. You have to turn them, can't discuss them in terms of use. And the distinctive use of, of machines is of course to increase the productivity of labor. And increasing the productivity of labor means that two things. One is that you need less laborers. So you create a surplus of labor. Also, you're creating more product. So you've got a surplus of use value. So you've got surplus of use values, surpluses of labor. One of the things Marx points out is that fixed capital, if it has a specific relation to circulating capital, and its relation is this, that, that circulating capital has to be prepared to wait because you've got to extract surpluses from them to put into the machines that are going to last 10 years and can return their value into the system over a 10 or 15 year period. So that, that, so that you need surplus capital a surplus, a surplus product and, 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 and surplus population in order for, to, to create fixed capital. Initially, that's very difficult. But then what you see is that fixed capital actually creates the conditions of its own reproduction. Fascinating. And you get a closed loop in which what fixed capital does is to create more and more unemployed laborers and more and more uh, surplus product which creates the possibility for more and more investment in fixed capital. So you get this kind of circulatory kind of process going on, which is, which is a bit crazy. And then Marx connects that to very much to this whole theory of the uh, of, of rate of profit and the falling rate of profit, which Marx makes clear, clear in the Grundrisse, as I said in my lecture uh, that I gave to, to, to all you lot uh, a couple of a couple of years back, that there is a relationship, a dialectical relationship between declining mass or, or, or a rising mass and falling rate. That a falling rate of profit doesn't bother you if you've got a sufficient mass. Uh, put in individualistic terms, if Jeff Bezos has a, a, a rate of return of 2% on his capital, he has so much money that that is almost enough to buy out the whole of the US government. Whereas if somebody has you know hundred dollars and they get a twenty percent rate of return, they, they can buy maybe a couple extra cups of coffee. So the mass is very important, and therefore you've got this kind of question of the rising mass and the falling rate. But what we see is that this fixed capital conundrum is actually putting a situation in which the falling rate of profit is accelerating, therefore the rising mass has to has to accelerate. Interesting. At that point, Marx says. This rising mass depends upon population growth. There has to be a solid rate of population growth in order for this to, to operate. And here too, we come into an interesting situation. What's the relationship between the dynamics of accumulation and population growth? And how is capital going to function when we have stable populations and negative populations? Now there are 50 countries in the world right now that have negative population growth. 
China is one of them. China had huge surpluses of labor. So the surplus mass could be taken up and that kind of way. But then it had a one child policy and the one child policy has been operating for nearly 40 years. And therefore we've got a, 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 a sort of contraction at the base of the population pyramid. And that contraction is now worrying people. So two years ago, the Chinese government said they were going to release the one child. You could have two child. Last week, they said you can have three children. People are not having kids. China has a demographic problem. Actually, all kinds of countries have demographic problems. You have one in Greece. Italy is terrible disaster. Japan has a demographic problem. Uh, you know, and then it's because of negative growth. Now, negative growth is good for the environment, but it's bad for capital. So here we go. This is a very interesting, but the circulation of fixed capital is contributing to this until Marx then says, well, here's an interesting solution. The use of fixed capital to increase the productivity of labor is just one use. Another use for fixed capital is as a dumping ground for surplus capital and surplus labor. Uh, and, and actually Marx says this, he says, you can counter the falling rate of profit by turning all of that fixed capital into investments in something which do not increase the productivity of labor. So you actually seek out investments which do not increase the productivity of labor. And you know, here I am in New York and one of my bet noirs is this horrible, horrible economic development called Hudson Yards. And you kind of go, what the hell has that got to do with increasing the productivity of labor? Nothing. What does it do in terms of absorbing vast amounts of surplus capital and surplus labor in a completely mindless form of urbanization. And I would like to submit that the mindless forms of, suburb, of urbanization that we see around the world right now are actually because capital needs a dumping ground. And that's a great dumping ground. And China is a fantastic example of this. The amount of surplus labor and surplus capital that got recycled into urbanization in China after 2008 was absolutely phenomenal. Now, nobody knows how important this is going to be in terms of increasing the productivity of labor. Some of it may increase the productivity of labor. But most of it, I think, is just, you know, the equivalent of bridges to nowhere. And Marx actually has a very interesting thing, which he mentions, that the parallel here is, is with military expenditures. And here, and Marx has a kind of says military expenditures and military benches are equivalent economically to taking as much value as you possibly can and taking it out of the middle of the ocean and just dumping it in the ocean. <laughs> That's a wonderful way to think about it. So capital has reached this thing where the big problem for capital right now is not falling rate, it's rising mass. And what to do with a rising mass. And that rising mass is, is it, it, full of these contradictions. Uh, now, here's, here's, here's another feature of this, because it suddenly struck me there was something weird about the fact that the, the share of wages in national incomes has diminished drastically since 1980. Now, it may not have drastic, done it in all around the world, but it's certainly done it in the United States, certainly done it in China. It's basically gone, in both of those countries, it, it's about half of what it was. So the share of wages is going down. Now, the second thing, which, which is consistent with one part of the falling rate of profit thesis, that, okay. The second part is that the proletariat has grown immensely. The proletariat was measured in 1980, it was about 2 billion people. By the time you get to 2010, it was about 3 billion people. All of China had come in. The, the, the remains of sort of peasant India were being mocked up and uh, peasant Indonesia and peasant, you know, life in Latin America were being mocked. The increase in the proletariat has, has, uh, wage labor has been enormous. Now, a lot of that wage labor may not be engaged in productive activity. And this is again, one of the things where this relation between productive and unproductive labor comes in. A lot of that labor may be actually exchanged not against capital, but against revenues, against revenues of the state, even revenues of workers as they sort of maybe have to pay for care or something like that. So, so here you have this thing, wages cut in half, the share of wages and national income cut in half, but the proletariat increasing immensely. 
why does that, you know, this is, this is the, and, and then at the same time, this whole kind of question of population growth and how population growth is suddenly, suddenly collapsing. And what that might mean for capital accumulation. How is capital going to operate in this changed environment? This is where the kind of environment of capital accumulation becomes significant. So Marx starts to talk about in detail, in great detail, the circulation of, 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 of fixed capital as autonomous and independent, but subsumed within. Marx's formulation of all of these, about all of these moments and circulations is they're all autonomous and independent, but subsumed within. And, 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 and people say, well, you know, that's a big mouthful, but it's a very interesting kind of conceptual form. People ask me, what is it, what's it like? What, what does that mean? And my easiest analogy is I say, it's a bit like being in a middle-class household and trying to raise a teenager. The teenagers spend all of their time proclaiming their, their independence and their autonomy, and they don't want to do this. Blah, 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 blah. On the other hand, they're subsumed within the global the, the, the household finance. And when things go bad, belly up. Where, where do people go? Well, you know, they go back to mummy and daddy and have to sort it out. So, you know, it's just like teenagers. So this kind of, this kind of mentality carries over to some of the stuff that goes on around fixed capital. And, and because Marx at some point says, well, you know, the trouble with the circulation of fixed capital is that it, you, you put a lot of money into fixed capital, but a lot of it flows back to the construction industries. But then there's the residual. How do, you, how do you pay for it? You can't do that without the credit system. And there's very interesting kind of moments. In the Grundrisse, Marx does not examine the credit system in great detail. But again and again, he says, the rise of the credit system has everything to do with the increasing dependence capitalist society has on the circulation of fixed capital. You cannot have fixed capital without the circulation of interest-bearing capital. So suddenly you've got another circulation process entering in which supports the fixed capital. So the interest bearing capital and the whole financial system is working on that. And of course the whole financial system, and you know, and there are these people who kind of say, well, you know, we've had debt and credit around since ancient Sumer. I mean, David Graeber used to say this, uh, Michael Hudson says this, but the credit system, as far as Marx is concerned, is a con construct which is building upon those capacities of credit and debt, but building it in such a way that actually you end up uh, creating a system of, of circulation of interest bearing capital, which is designed to support the further construction and automation and, 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 and expense of, of fixed capital formation. That's what he gets into now. What Marx doesn't do is to talk about the state. What he should have done is to talk about the state. He should have talked about banking and circulation and so on. But my point here is this. Here is Marx talking about capital as a system. Circulation of money, circulation of, uh, of, of labor, labor capacity, circulation of capital as, as, as capital, circulation of fixed capital, circulation of interest bearing capital, and then there will be a circulation of, uh, and in the plans he suggested, circulation of taxation, uh, revenues and, 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 and uh, banking capital. And even at some point or other started to say, well, these form separate classes. So he starts to talk about the separate class of industrialists versus uh, financiers and so on. Now, all of this is kind of internalized within the dynamics of the Grundrisse. And when you, when you, when you approach the reading of the Grundrisse, this idea of totality, and then you say the different circulatory processes and the different moments of those circulatory processes in this totality and what they're about and how they work and, and what ways, what roles they play. Then you start to get a real, a real different picture of how capital works. And Rosdolsky, who picked up this thing, uh, the German version of it and wrote a book about Grundrisse, so it's still a very interesting book to read. What Rosdolsky said was this, he said, you know, I came across this manuscript, which is very rare, actually of all places in the New York Public Library. It was a Jewish immigre living in New York. And he started to read the Grundrisse in one of its rare, rare uh, German versions. And he said, basically, once you read this, your whole idea about what political economy is about changes. 
the trouble is that Marx has written it in such a way that hardly anyone will understand what he's talking about. So what I've been trying to do is to actually read Marx in light of these macro kind of features and to get a sense of what it is that how we should understand capital and how we should understand what it is we might do about it. I've mentioned the double consciousness is there. Towards the end, Marx comes up with an interesting figure. He talks about the emancipated labor. And several times in the Grundrisse, he kind of hints at this. What would the emancipated labor, living within that circulatory process of labor capacity, what would they say about how to escape from the prison that has been set up, how to deal with the alienations involved? How? And at this point, there comes practical consciousness as opposed to double consciousness. And I think that question is posed in the Grundrisse too, because Marx at some point says the, the, the laborer, uh, the emancipated laborer is somebody who will understand their situation and that then gets back to the educational side. How do we educate? How do we think about it? And how is education going to be structured? So that it will take this idea of the, the totality and really run with it. And of course, it's going to go against the grain to talk about totality because, you know, all, all the, uh, you know, post-structuralists kind of say, uh, you know, all against totalizing discourses and totalizing this and that and totalitarianism and blah, blah, blah. So to talk about the totality is anathema. But you've got to do it. We've got to do it. And Marx does it big time in the Grundrisse. And it's the totality and the circulatory processes that he deals with which existed also in space and time. And I haven't had, haven't had time to talk about the space time dimensions of this, but clearly the system is not simply circular, it's, it's expansionary, it's a spiral. So the mass, the expanding mass means globalization, the expanding mass means uh, changing geographies of all of this. So we can get into that if you want. But the, the, those are some of the things that came out of the Grundrisse. I found it fascinating to, to to try and summarize it. I hope you got a sense of it. Okay, David. Thanks for introducing us to your latest achievement. <laughs> okay, you have been productive so far, I understand. But, but it was only two hours a day. I spent two hours a day on this for a year. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, let me ask the audience for questions, comments, etc. I can see Maria. Okay, Maria, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes we can hear you. Thank you, David, uh, for a wonderful uh, talk and uh, for sharing these insights with us. Um, I have a question. I, I go along with you on the totality um, idea a long way. Um, but if we take this thought to its full consequences, then would it mean that any type of um, um, political subjectivity produced within a historical geographical capitalist geographical space and political space is by default part of this totality example. You brought the examples yourself. So what's happening there with the development of practice of the left is they cannot escape being part of this same totality or radical or imaginary, social imaginary or whichever way we put it. The same with uh, individual subjectivities. Uh, we can be a, a seller of work power, a buyer, a consumer. At the same time, we can be, uh, we have been protesters, yeah? But then um, even our protesting identity and subjectivization is still within that um, capitalist totality. And actually, I think what happened with the left governments, socialist governments that ran Europe for a while since the 1980s is also a very good example of that, how they could not escape, did not escape um, pursuing this totality. So the question is, 
um, shouldn't we indeed be looking at spaces, places, and people who remain partly outside this at the moment, like the indigenous uh, population? I know there's a big movement in academia at the moment, but I'm not trying to be fanciful or, or um, fashionable. But is there more to that than... Can we do more about that? How can we bridge Marxist thought? That's the kind of thing I'm grappling with at the moment, with the with the really important um, existence of uh, populations outside this totality. How can we make that work in practice, in order to produce change? Is it possible? I don't know. <laughs> Well, I'll take an answer to that. I'll, I'll give you what I think his answer is to it, and then I can look a bit on my, how I think about it. But Marx's answer to that is there are enough contradictions at work within the totality. For, you know, the Leonard Cohen song, the cracks are there and the light gets in. There are enough, there are enough contradictions. And, and, and he is against the idea that something can be manufactured from outside. So, so he's, he's against utopian thinking and idealism and all the rest of it. And he says, well, bas basically, the emancipated laborer is somebody who can sit with their situation and by critical analysis, see the contradictions in their own situation. And through observation and concept formation and all the rest of it. And, so, and at this point, Marx is very interesting. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't attempt to superimpose anything on anybody. He kind of says, basically, the emancipated laborer. And it's a very interesting figure. And, and, and it's a bit like uh, I, I was sort of tempted to, in, when I was writing about this, to introduce some of the stuff that I'd done in the past about the insurgent architect. You know, that what separates the worst of architects is the best, best of bees is this, that, you know, they let the concept in imagination rather than, but they're doing it on the ground. It's only an important thing. So for Marx, the material base of a transformation is going to become, come about by, by individuals or collectivities analyzing their situation and creating, creating alternatives within the context of the totality. Otherwise, you know, if you, if you say, well, okay, uh, uh, the Zapatistas are going to save us or the, uh, I know you're not saying that, but you know, if, if you're looking for, 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 for that outside. Now, my own view is, and I think the outside is very important. I mean, this is what I think I learned a bit in Latin America, that, that really you couldn't, and, and, and when Marx sort of talks about uh, the meaning, how, how, you know, meaningful art occurred back then because it was more simple, uh, within, so 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 I I so I think the whole kind of question. I mean, I, I was really shocked in Ecuador the way in which Correa went after the indigenous populations and the way in which he he, he reneged entirely on the the ecological mission, I, I, and and took off after the feminists and, and all the rest of it. I mean, and you kind of go well, you know, if you do that, and the thing was, if you do that, then then then. You're gonna stir up, a, a whole, as as happened in Nicaragua. So that one of the lessons that comes out of this is that that yes, to the degree that people there are existing systems of meaning in the world in some ways. And what was so so encouraging about those new constitutions which were set up in Ecuador and Bolivia was entirely this idea that meaning, as it was going to be constitutionalized, was around the idea of plurinationality and rights of nature and things and that. So there was a there was a, an attempt initially to establish some sort of coherent meaning, but then at some point or other, it all kind of got wiped away as Korea became more and more sort of uh, a caudillo and, and, and therefore uh, got into problems that way. So my answer to that is, well, yes, if there, if there are things going on out there, uh, as, as they are in, in, in indigenous life in the Andes, for example, I think that you should, that they should be in, you know, respected, incorporated to some degree into what, what left developmentalism might be about. I don't want to abandon left developmentalism, but it has to be one that, which pays attention to this loss of meaning 
and 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 uh, and, and the emptiness of a much of what bourgeois life is about. And we have you know we we have uh, issues here. I think. I mean, this whole thing about yeah, you know, more people died in the opioid epidemic than died through COVID nineteen. And well, not more people, about the same number died actually over a ten year period, of course. Whereas, and if you look at what people, you know, the, what everybody said about COVID nineteen and the, the lack of concern about the opioid, I, I, I mean, there, there, it's out of that that I think comes. Those are the sorts of cracks that that, that light in, and that therefore uh, the the emancipated labourer would look at that and say, "This is unacceptable. These are ex-labourers who've been discarded and treated as disposable people, and the, their pain is such that they have gone into opioids." I mean, it's very interesting that the the, the, the drug of choice in in North America is opioids, in in, in East and Southeast Asia, it's uh, amphetamines. You know. So, <laughs> I mean, you get a sense of this, uh, you know. And so, so you know, when when you're faced when you're faced with that, and, and, and I think people realize in their daily lives that some of these things are going wrong, and I think the de destruction of neighborhoods and all those sorts of things are are, are very much in, in in the work. So yes, I, I think I think you know, obviously political. Consciousness is, is is troubling in the sense that yes, we we're inside, and as because we we're inside, uh, we're all of us contaminated, and we, therefore we can't, you know. We, which is which is why I, I kind of think about my own double consciousness, you know, how how much I enjoy from what 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 capital does and how it's done, and and then, and and then I think to myself, do I want really want to get rid of this? <laughs> <laughs> and, and and then I think, then I look at the other side of it, and I say, yeah, I do want to get rid of this. And so this double consciousness, I think, and I think political organisations should be frank and honest about double, their double consciousness in relationship to this. Thank you, David. Thank Έχουμε άλλες ερωτήσεις ή ε, γραπτά στο chat και ελληνικά. Αν επιθυμείτε ε, η αγγλικά ή παίρνετε το λόγο και ρωτάτε κατευθείαν. Do we have any more questions? You can uh, either write them down in the chat or simply uh, ask to speak. Kosti, you have to turn on your microphone. Okay, okay. You are talking. So let me ask uh, something while we are waiting for other comments. Um, listening, David, uh, your description about totality and uh, circulation and so on, uh, I was expecting at the end uh, to make a link with uh, the COVID-19 and uh, the lockdowns, the global lockdowns, uh, and how those lockdowns have really any effect with uh, the circulation, particularly uh, the first example of circulation, uh, let's say of labor, going to the labor market when everything was closed down, so the labor the laborer didn't have the opportunity to go as a seller to do that. So I'm I wondering whether you can make uh, the link now. Yeah, that, 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 that could be a whole new lecture. Um, no, I know it's going to be a whole lecture, but you could summarize a bit. Yeah, no. Well, let me let me summarize it a bit this way. One of the things that's happened with increasing mass and increasing the means need to absorb the mass is that certain divisions of labor have come up, which are very significant, very new divisions of labor, which have come up. For instance, uh, if, if there is not an acceleration of turnover time, and Marx makes this point in the Grun research, that, that the, the, the optimal turnover time for capital in the market is zero. And it takes zero time. It means that consumption has to be instantaneous. Instant. 
So you've got, therefore, uh, capital since the 1980s has been investing in instant forms of consumption, which are spectacle, soccer matches, concerts, and particularly tourism. One of the big responses to 2007, 2008 was an increase in tourism. I mean, they were, went from 800 million to 1.4 billion in two years. It was, it was a huge increase. And of course, you've got the, all these fixed capital in, in Norwegian you know, cruise liners and blah, 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 and all those other things that you, 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 you see. So that, that industry, of course, was almost totally collapsed by the COVID, which is the main, which has been the big, so the big question now is how can it revive? And the you know, airlines and all of and, 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 and what it put into profile. Some industries, of course, worked very well. I mean, uh, I mentioned to you earlier, uh, because I got tired of being locked down all the time, I bought a car in New York. Well, it turned out the car industry did okay during, the, during COVID. People, people wanted to buy cars because you can go out in your car and you can drive around. And if you're middle class and you're locked down, then you need a car to go out and sit in the woods or watch the sunset over the beach or something like that. You know, so so actually, what, what I did was to change my consumer habits in certain kinds of ways, and I've now got a car which I'd never had in New York except in the first year. Uh, so you know, so so yeah, certain 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 divisions of labor got hit very hard tourist industry obviously and there's a big kind of question as to how far it can come back and whether it will come back in the way that it came back what i see right now is an attempt to revive it i mean all the ads on us television now are about going to the you know going to the caribbean going here going there and getting back on the cruise liners and, and everything so there's an attempt to do that now that's a big problem because the mass is being a being is being being absorbed, the mass of capital is being absorbed in something where there's instantaneous uh, consumption. That has been brought home, but the, the, thing, the thing is that once we're all vaccinated, what are the barriers to resumption of that? You know, I, I, I mean, once we're all vaccinated, are we going to get a big surge in the uh, construction of affordable housing for all of the people who are homeless in New York City? I don't think so. I don't think so, because that's not where capital is going to go. So the big issue, and that's why I, I said, as far as capital is concerned, that the dynamics of capital are such that you know, there are certain areas it's going to build. I mean, we're still building here in New York at a frantic race, pace, but it's all high-end construction condominiums and all the rest of it in the midst of, uh, and I don't see that changing. I don't see that changing right now. I don't see the consciousness there to change it. And, and, I, I, and of course, the left is in, in, is in a very weak position right now. I mean, I was thinking the other day, you know, one of my friends, and I'm sure you all agree, we all look at the situation and say it's kind of basically insane. This is an insane economy and insane everything. Well, I remember back at the end of the 1960s, in that period from 68 to about 75, where it also seemed insane. The difference was that back then, we on the left thought we were on the right road, road you know, right side of history, that we were going to make the future. We thought we were going to do that. We don't think that now. In fact, we're on a defensive. I mean, everything that even smelled of the left wing. I mean, you had your experience with Syriza, Podemos has gone down, the Labour Party in Britain, which showed a little few signs, has gone down. France, the you know, Communist Party and the Socialist Party have disappeared, and you're left with a big contest going on between Macron and Le Pen. That's, that's your political option right now. So we're, where's the left in all of this? Well, the left is, you know, it, we, can, we can suggest reformist measures like, you know, we have to do something about social inequality and the fact that the virus hit so hard against uh, African-American and, 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 and immigrant communities and all that. We can say all of that stuff. We can push for all that stuff. But what we're seeing is instead, we're seeing this right wing were there on a mission. And I'm very serious when I say to you, Trump announced just two days ago that he is going to be reinvested as president in August. And he, you know, we have a habit of listening to when he says things like that and thinking the guy's crazy. He's going to try. He's going to try. He's got, 
more than half of the state legislatures are behind him. There's a big segment of the military, which is white supremacist. The police forces vary a lot. Well, you know what police forces are like in Greece, and I have to tell you. Well, entrenched versions of Golden Dawn, you know. I mean, look, you've got you've got a situation in this country where they're going to create mayhem sometime in midsummer, and the only way to get out of the mayhem is for Trump to be brought back to Washington. I'm serious. I'm, I'm you know, one of the big things we, we should learn from the historical sequences of this sort is that everybody says, no, that cannot possibly happen until it happens. And then it's too late. And, and I think that we've got a political situation in this country right now, which is highly dangerous, highly dangerous. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very optimistic about we're going to come out of this very well. I mean, yeah, I, was, well. I was not aware of it. Yeah. Oh. No, it's, 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 the Supreme Court is gone, you know, as a, as a barrier. Who, who, the only thing that stands between that is, is, is Biden and so on. And to be honest, he's not doing a bad job. So we've got a question from Facebook, uh, David. So if you don't mind, I'll read it out. Sure. By uh, Aris Kosionides. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. A question. At the critical moment when workers are prepared to consider the idea of capital as a totality, there would be competing narratives, nationalists, for example, to explain the circumstances. What could be the tipping point for the Marxist explanation to win over in this contest? And if it does not, does the cycle repeat itself until it reaches a similar point? Thank you. Um. Yeah, the nationalist question is a, a, is a again. There's there's some of this it tracks back, by the way. I mean, uh, to the way in which uh, capital sought out labor forces, particularly in the 1960s. I mean, recall the situation in the 1960s. There were labor sh labor scarcities, labor shortages uh, in most of the advanced capitalist countries. So what happened? Well, uh, you know, the Germans uh, brought in the Turks, uh, the French, the Maghrebians, uh, and these were state-sponsored things. And, and therefore the need for, and this comes back to the population side, the need for a larger population. The British brought in from the, uh, their empire, the, from the, the US reformed its uh, immigration laws so that it was open for immigration from anywhere. And part of the dynamism of the US has been uh, because it's been a fairly open society in, in, that, in that kind of way. And now the fact that Trump wants to close it down is, is, real, is, a, real, is a real problem for capital. And, and, and uh, so, so capital is gonna need the expanding labor forces. Nationalism to the degree that it's gonna be about keeping labor forces out. And from a standpoint of labor, that is a protective thing for them, so that a lot of labor groups have come together in support of anti-immigrant politics. And as you probably know, quite a few left people in, in France moved from the Communist Party to the Le Pen because of the immigration kind of question. So the immigration question is, a, is, a, is, 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 is you're quite right in kind of saying this is a, this is a, this is a major thing, and it, it connects very much uh, to this whole kind of requirement that capital has for an expanding population base, what it's doing. Now it can expand its population base two ways, either by importing labor, uh, which it did in the 1960s, and then it got into sort of all kinds of problems. And we see recently Angela Merkel uh, welcomed a million people from Syria because it would increase the labor force. And of course she got really you know, crushed uh, by the, the, the populist response to that. So that the whole kind of question of labor allocation and, and, and circulation of labor and how it operates in space and time and immigration and relationship to nationalism, you can't in a way separate the whole kind of question of the need for labor power and the need for an immigrant labor force or those sorts of things from the nationalist reaction. 
the nationalist reaction uh, uh, proceeds at two levels. One is it, it allows the nationalist election uh, allows you to divide the working class by turning to a lot of people in the working class and saying your problems are due to immigrants. I mean, you see that daily in, in the United States, that sort of argument made. It's all about immigrants. Immigrants are the problem. You keep the immigrants out and all, all your problems will be solved. No way it's going to happen. But nevertheless, it's a very telltale thing. So and the anti-immigration thing on the right from the right wing standpoint is a very, very strong one. And it's, the, it's a strong one which may actually un, underpin uh, or, or un, undermine uh, even Biden's presidency. It's the one difficulty he has is to deal with immigration, uh, immigration policy. Uh, but the, 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 the second point here is that the, the, the use of nationalism uh, to both scapegoat uh, minorities or scapegoat whoever. In other words, in other words capital is, 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 is again has a double consciousness itself in, in relationship to this. On the one hand, you want to scapegoat immigrants and you want to scapegoat, uh, you know, my, my minority groups and, and the rest of it, scapegoat women or whatever in the labor force. You want to, you want to have that. On the other hand, you need the labor force. And, and that varies a lot, of course, between which, which what kind of sector you're working in. And there is, by the way, a, another aspect to this which I can get into, which comes out of the equalization of the rate of profit, which I can talk about separately. Thank you. Have we got any more questions? Έχουμε ερωτήσει. Μπορείτε να πάρετε και το λόγο απευθεία να ρωτήσετε, αν θέλετε. Eric. Eric, thank you, David. Um, in the tableau that you painted, there were two things for me that stood out. Um, things that perhaps have been ignored very much, both by Marxist theory over the past 20 years or so, as well as by left politics, which is alienation. Alienation, which you defined in a very particular kind of way, that is a sacrifice and loss uh, on the one hand, and then related to that, the drive unleashed by that loss to compensate, uh, to find some form of satisfaction to cover up the loss um, and the sacrifice of alienation, which leads to the double consciousness that you pointed out. Now, that double consciousness is, of course, internal to the subject, <laughs> as you rightly, rightly pointed out, too. It's, 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 it's it's internal. Isn't it the case that both theoretically and politically we have not paid enough attention to the articulation between the analysis of capital that you put uh, for us on the one hand and this uh, internalized duplicity, double consciousness and how we can deal with that? Because I think, isn't it the case that dealing with that, both theoretically and politically, necessitates expanding our conceptual and theoretical understanding of what capital is all about? Yeah, well, I don't disagree with you. I mean, it's very, uh, it's very, uh, I mean, I, I, I will be very concerned these days for this kind of, uh, a terrain in which uh, people can mop up all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories and start to spread them around and so on. Um, alienated populations don't necessarily revolt against the source of their alienation, mm -hmm. which is the big, which is the big problem. And and so one of the things why I think the theory of alienation is terribly important and why the left failure in some ways to integrate what alienation is about. And what I really like about the Grundrisse is, is there is that integration. I mean, Marx starts off more or less by, by saying, uh, we have to understand that as capital becomes more dominant, so we become uh, victims of its abstractions. Now, how do you politicize against an abstraction? How do you blame an abstraction so that, that you know, 
And, and, and what he's talking about here is, is, of course, the abstractions of the market. In other words, he's not saying anything more profound than Adam Smith said when Adam Smith talked about the hidden hand of the market, which guides and does these things. Uh, we're, and Marx says, says, well, we're victims of abstraction. And that abstraction means that we have lost our autonomy. We've lost our, well, no, we've lost it. We never had it, you know. I mean, we, we, in other words, the path towards uh, truly in being a true individual, an autonomous individual is blocked entirely by these abstractions. And you can't send abstractions to jail, even though the abstractions are in, can be blamed for unemployment, uh, you know, deindustrialization and all the rest of it. So the abstract forces are there. And how do you, and so the left has to kind of figure out how, how, how to attack those abstractions. And one of the things we have to do is I think real, you know, one of the things I think Marx is trying to do is to alert us to the way in which alienation and the abstractions are connected to each other. And at some point or other, what is interesting is, is the fact that the capital is as alienated as labor. I mean, it's alienated capital and alienated labor, which are locked in a deadly embrace. And I was thinking about, well, you know, how do I, how do I give a metaphor for this? And I think it's like that fabulous uh, uh, Conan Doyle uh, story about, uh, you know, the chase of Moriarty by Sherlock Holmes. And both of them kind of, you know, he's, you know, the, 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 the Napoleon of crime versus the great, and they're both locked in this thing and they end up, he ends up the story and Conan Doyle was fed up with writing about uh, Sherlock Holmes, so he wanted to kill him off. So he, he pitches him over a precipice in, in, in deadly embrace with Moriarty. <laughs> and it's, it's that, that deadly embrace of labor and capital that occurs and is, and is manufactured and created in the labor process. It's not there in the market because it's external at that point, but in, inside of the, the labor process. So I think that's right. That, uh, that is where the, the, the big point of alienation comes. And therefore the release from that and the release from the abstractions is going to be part of the, what the political project has to be. But, I, I, but I, 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 I give up with the idea that this can ever become a major motif in left education. I mean, I, I got to try, but you know, it's not going to get very far. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Έχουμε ερωτήσεις στο Facebook ή απευθείας στο chat. So may I ask one thing uh, before we give other people time? Coming back to Costi's question, coming back to COVID-19 now, David. Um, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic is producing a kind of crisis, right? A crisis that is related to a virus, but which has to do with the way the system works in, in many different ways. And it's a crisis that is, for certain countries, it's an economic crisis. For a lot of people, it will mean bankruptcies, private bankruptcies, business bankruptcies, and so on. And you know, you've theorized a lot in the past about how, how capitalism deals with its own internal crisis, right? And what it does, you talk about the spatial fix as a way of dealing with crisis and so on. This is a different kind of crisis. You could say that, of course, it is a capitalist crisis too, but it's not directly related to the circulation of capital. What do you think that the, the response of capitalism will be? How will capitalism use this kind of crisis to you know, get out of it? And how will that affect the different um, circuits of circulation? Um, I, I think, uh, <clears throat> I, I want to be careful here, but for some people, this was not a crisis. For the ultra wealthy, this was not a crisis. This is an opportunity. Uh, and and uh, the stock market, it was not a crisis, it was an opportunity. Uh, Amazon has grown immensely through the crisis. I mean, the delivery structures, the, 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 the new employment structures of, of delivery workers. I mean, there's a whole army out there now of people deliver, delivering things. 
And I think a lot of that is going to stay. And, and, and to the degree that Amazon has uh, consolidated, at least in the United States, it's probably done it elsewhere, but to the degree it's consolidated in the way it has, it's an immense power block. And, and, and all of the high tech companies have, have benefited hugely. You know, we're, we're all at home watching Netflix, you know, so we've got the Netflix economy, we've got the, all, all, all of this. So, so there's a, the, the, so, so, so that the differential manner in which this unfolded is, 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 is in itself significant. Now, this is a crisis which is not part of the inner crisis. Uh, Marx would, would, I think, say this is not an, uh, a crisis of internal crisis of capitalism. This is not its internal contradictions. This is a contradiction which arises out of the metabolic relation to nature, in which capital has a role because the metabolic relation to nature is partly constructed through the way in which capital has been uh, raking over nature and converting nature into uh, places which are used. And, and there's a good deal of evidence, it seems to me, that the, the rise of these new pandemics, and this is not the first one, <clears throat> the whole series of them, the, the rise of these has something to do with a transformation, uh, ecological transformation, which is occurring as the mass of capital flows out across the world and starts to occupy all the spaces and you turn them into spaces which are, quote, um, Marx uses this phrase in, 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 uh, uh, in the Grundrisse a lot, turn them into something that's, quote, adequate for capital. And one of the things I would say is that the form of urbanization that we have right now, about two thirds of it is really adequate to capital, which leaves about one third of it to be worked on by those people who are trying to make a decent urbanization but for people in a decent living environment. And, but that's, that's the lower third. The big stuff is the, uh, is the, uh, uh, is what is being done is what, what is being done to the built environment through uh, through uh, investments by capital which are quote adequate to capital not adequate to people so making so making a, a kind of urbanization that's adequate to people as opposed to adequate to capital seems to me to be one of the messages which we would which I would want to uh, take uh, out of this and, and and that can come out of uh, a, a critical examination of what happened during the the COVID uh, epidemic. To be sure, a lot of a lot of individuals will be sacrificed, you know, and, and, and badly hurt, and you know, livings have been destroyed. There, there's clearly emerging in this country and maybe elsewhere uh, a mental health dimension to all of this that is, you know, seriously seriously troubling. And what we're seeing, of course, is the the, the enormous increase in and collective gun violence and shootings and all kinds of things. So there's a disintegration of the, whatever, whatever elements of social bonding were once left in what I would loosely call the community or the living space or whatever, uh, that, 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 that can keep some of this under wraps. But it's not, it, 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 there's been a great deal of destruction there. But you know, in, in there's a sense in which capital doesn't care about that. I, I mean, in the same way that the pharmaceutical companies actually loved the opioid crisis and loved what was going on there, and they made billions out of it, and some of the you know rich richest families in the world came out of it. You know, well, it's all just money making for them. So we've got we, we've got of that. So 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 big big question, it seems to me, is to what degree public opinion is going to be mobilized to start to say, well, you know, the, the, the structures that took this external crisis, and let's say it's external, but fueled by some internal pressures, the external, the external nature of the crisis had differential impacts within the system, and capital is extremely adaptable I mean, this is a terrifying thing, extremely adaptable. It'll make money out of anything. And, and how much money have the pharmaceutical companies made out of the vaccine stuff? 
that's been it's been great for them and 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 great for their shareholders so so you know never let a good crisis go to waste is their their motto and and so all of those who've suffered there needs to be a collective way of organizing what but i don't see political parties able to do it the kind of thing that you know the labor party under corbyn might have been able to do or theresa may have been able to do if they did you know head right and and but they must but they're all wiped out effectively now they have that they have, they're not able to do it and this is leaves the terrain open to 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 right wing manipulations which are going on in this country in crazy fashions i mean just to watch fox news it's just just wow it's amazing and, and you know uh, members of, of 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 the republican party in congress saying that what happened on January the 6th was nothing more than a general kind of a, like a visitation of the capital by friendly friendly people. They actually talk about it that way. You know, you look at the pictures and you say, well, what? But nobody, everybody thinks those pictures are doctored. They've been made up. Maybe produced by Steven Spielberg or somebody like that. I mean, it's just, just it, it, it's just an insane situation. But it's but it's one that uh, so I'm 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 really quite scared as to what's going to happen here. It's not this this is this is not really funny. Thank you. Echume Alessorotisis. Any more questions? I don't see anything. So if uh, we don't have any more questions, interventions, or whatever. Uh, so let's thanks again, David, for your marvelous talk. So nice to see you, even if it is from your home at New York. At least we have the electronic system via Zoom to see each other. Uh, so let's celebrate this kind of uh, uh, of sight of uh, not being able to see each other from long distance and have some wine and chipuro and uzo. But let's yeah. hope for better days. Okay. <laughs> yes. I mean, how are things in Greece right now? Can you talk a little bit about that? So, I mean, I don't know if, uh, well, I definitely agree with you from about the left situation here. I mean, Syriza is definitely unable really to catch up and uh, the right is inoffensive. Um, it has all the enormous uh, help by the mass media, you mentioned Fox, but there is no channel in Greece that does not support the government. No one channel. Right. Of course, we have uh, two newspapers, but uh, not with uh, high circulation. And um, I just uh, wrote down all your comments about uh, left wing de develop developmentalism and uh, I can see a lot of uh, mistakes by Syriza, especially on the development issue. I mean, starting with the gold mines up in Halkiviki down uh, to real estate and uh, huge uh, complex uh, tourist complexes. And now we have the new, uh, the new version of uh, so-called uh, development with those huge wind turbines all across the mountains of Greece, uh, turning uh, Greece to a battery for Europe. And there is a very strong social movement in different places trying to protect 
the mountains and fight against uh, those uh, huge uh, turbines. Of course, there is a NIMBY situation in many of those uh, cases, but uh, the issue is uh, quite, uh, quite important. And I cannot see how Syriza can really uh, take uh, everything into account. And uh, following uh, your comment and Eric's uh, comment, uh, the problem of uh, double consciousness, of course, is not only in the agenda, but it's never imagined, never, never thought about it, never thought about it. So, not uh, interesting uh, news, I'm afraid. Although some of us, which are lucky enough uh, to be vaccinated, we can hope for some yeah. summer yeah. break. Yeah, but I hope it, so. Okay. Okay, David. Thanks no, a thank lot. Can I, can I just report something alternative from uh, the periphery of Greece, which I found? Yes, yes, Maria, go ahead. Some small ethnographies here. We, we cannot hear you well. Ah, can you hear me better now? Here it is. Yes. Can you hear? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, there's something interesting uh, doing a bit small ethnographies here in the periphery. And it's um, small, medium enterprises across Greece that have been badly hit by the, the financial crisis have been actually rejuvenated by the state uh, central funding that went uh, to these very small self-sustaining enterprises, right? Uh, they've been rejuvenated or survived through direct state funding because of the COVID-19 European funds. And this on one hand has um, boosted the, the current uh, right-wing government Okay, so they, these small medium enterprises have become supportive of the government. On the other hand, it seems to have um, put um, a break to the, the plans to kill off all these small medium enterprises and uh, let big capital come in and dominate the uh, Greek economy. It's a very preliminary and kind of uh, just uh, from a very small empirical basis. But I find the procedure interesting. And we're talking about, in these, we're talking about people whose uh, livelihoods are not about big consumption. It's about, uh, it's almost alternative livelihoods, right? That they, they enjoy life. They don't want to have big houses or big, they just want to sustain themselves. So this constituency, uh, seems to have done quite all right uh, under the COVID uh, circumstances. So I'm just reporting <laughs> with a little bit of ethnographic from field work <laughs> from the north of Greece at the moment. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so if we don't see any other reports from different parts of Greece or Europe, so let's uh, thanks David again. There's a question uh, over chat. There's a question on chat, maybe. Ah, uh, okay. This is, this is Ruli, yeah. Uh, it, uh, Ruli asks, um, thank you for your amazing lecture. I have a question. What should be the dynamics of the struggles that develop individually and or collectively as resistance to the compulsions of various aspects of the daily lives and places where they are established, try to control. I'm not sure I'm reading this properly. Here's the dynamics of the struggles that develop individually and or collectively as resistance to the compulsions of various aspects of the daily lives and places. Excuse me for the bad translation. I think that what is the dynamic of the social relations των ανθρώπων, στις περιοχές που ζουν, ε, προκειμένου να αντιμετωπίσουν τον έλεγχο και τον καταδυναστισμό, το, την καταδυνάστευση όλων των ε, κυρίαρχων ομάδων. Ε, οι δυναμικές των ανθρώπων στην καθημερινότητα, στους τόπους που ζουν, έτσι. Ναι, ναι, ναι. 
So Ruli was asking David, what are the dynamics of um, the people in their everyday life and the places they live in individually or collectively to resist, let's say, to um, the, the, the powers that suppress them? Well, one, one, one of the big difficulties of being on lockdown is that I, I've lost almost all contact with any of the social organizations that I was uh, you know, vaguely connected to and worked with uh, here in New York. So I really don't know exactly what people are doing. I, 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 this is you know, one of the things that uh, intrigues me as to what forms of organization there, I, I talked a little bit to students, but uh, and my own circumstance was such that I really couldn't get out. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, you know, it's a bit difficult for me uh, to, to to give proper answers to that. Uh, there are presumably things going on on the ground with various groups doing things, but I really have no idea what they are. What I do know is that. Most of the political organizations that I would have expected to be very vociferous have not really been there. I mean, although there is a sort of bit of a leftist social democratic wing within the Democratic Party here that is trying to articulate uh, something uh, rather different. So, you know, there is a there is something going on of that sort, but I, I really have no idea what it is and nor am I in a position really to give any advice to anybody as to what to do. I mean, I, that, that's, that's beyond what I can, what I can. Uh, hi, uh, can I say something, please? Yes, Lila. Of course. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, David. This was exciting. But since the um, discussion sidetracked towards the COVID situation and towards grief, I just wanted to add something because it is very important that uh, as a Greek government uh, took the opportunity of, uh, um, of the lockdown in order to pass uh, anti-working class and anti-university um, uh, and so on measures, for example, uh, the eight hour period of uh, work has been uh, not abolished, but uh, severe. The universities are going to be patrolled by police. Um, the, the city is going to be uh, privatized in very important places like uh, the Elinico uh, airport, ex airport. Uh, with the very uh, wild uh, privatization, the um, uh, National Gardens, the Philopapu Hill, and uh, various other very, spot, very important spots of the city will be uh, taken over. And uh, uh, also the Acropolis has been cemented. It is a, a very sad situation there. So really, I mean, since you asked about the situation in Greece, I just wanted to add this to what Kostich said and Aris and, uh, and Maria, uh, because this is a very, very um, authoritarian and uh, ugly situation. The people are not able to, to uh, you know, mobilize. The students did mobilize, but they were uh, hushed because of the COVID uh, situation and because of lockdowns. And also uh, in various communities of Greece, like Neos Milny, there were clashes uh, about uh, police uh, patrolling and uh, violence. So really, it's not very mild here. Uh, and it's not just the economic aspect, which has the small and medium enterprises hit by the uh, COVID situation. And uh, somehow, as Maria said, the funded to, to <laughs> To, to boost the, 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 the petty bourgeois aspect of Greek society. It's very bad, it's very ugly, and I think uh, it's going to last. It's going to make Athens and uh, uh, broader Greece into a very big wasteland of, uh, you know, privatizations and police, uh, uh, especially in the universities. 
that's what I wanted to add. And thank everybody to uh, for what they they you know presented to Greece as well. But thank especially David for his rejuvenating. I mean, I don't know ever anybody worldwide reading Marx and giving new insights, but David, thank you very much. Yeah. Since we are adding things, can I add something? Uh, except uh, from being the battery of Europe, we are also the um, trap of Europe for refugees and migrants. Mm -hmm. And that situation is really a disgrace. It is not uh, in Athens at the moment. So as um, city boys and girls, we tend to forget it. But it is a very big issue in uh, most of the Greek islands along Turkish uh, coastline and in uh, some of the uh, camps around the big cities. I think um, it is a situation, a problem uh, that will erupt uh, violently in the next uh, few months or years. So here is where we are, David. I don't know if uh, we gave you enough uh, insights from this side of uh, Europe. Anyone else, guys? Friends, comrades? Okay, we can keep uh, discussing for hours, but I don't know. I mean, we don't like to exhaust yourself <coughs> being so kind to join us from New York. So uh -huh. let's say thanks and uh, goodbye to everyone. And uh, let's hope to see each other soon, not via Zoom, but uh, in person. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.